Old Testament reading for the last Sunday of the church here is from Isaiah chapter 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more, more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy. In all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many colored robes, the king's daughter is led to the king. With her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the time and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. 
But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess the Christian. Amen. On Wednesday of last week, NASA launched the Artemis I rocket, the most powerful rocket ever built. And this is the first step in mankind's return to the moon. And from almost 58,000 miles away, the spacecraft sent back live pictures of the Earth, pictures that haven't been seen since December of 1972 and Apollo 17, the last time man walked on the moon. And as I meditated and studied this text from Matthew 25 and watched that view from the Artemis I rocket, it was a stunning sight to behold. Pictures of Earth, of that little blue disk hanging in the darkness of space that God would care for the people that live here and that he will return to that little blue disk in glory and triumph on the last day. And we know it will happen because Jesus tells us as much. And he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The scientists and the engineers at NASA know everything there is about that spacecraft they sent up on Wednesday. They know where it is, they know how fast it's going, they know where it's going. They even know where it's going to splash down in the ocean when it returns. They're prepared. They've planned for every detail. They've worked diligently for this mission for years. For this mission, for the missions to come, to return to the moon, and eventually they would like to get to Mars. But they're ready. They're prepared. But none of us knows the day nor the hour of Christ's return. All we know is that it's going to happen. And we have to be ready. We have to be prepared. Not like a doomsday prepper who's waiting for the zombie apocalypse or even for a nuclear disaster, but truly ready for the return of Jesus to judge the living and the dead. And so Jesus tells the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Five are wise and five are not. Five have brought extra oil for their lamps. Five brought only the oil that was in their lamps. And none of them knew when the bridegroom would arrive. But the five wise virgins were ready. They were prepared. You might think of it like having the battery charged in your flashlight. I carry this one in my backpack. Every now and then I have to pull it out and charge it so I know it's ready when I need it. Or maybe you use or have had one of these, a solar charger. You can be out camping or hiking or fishing and you can charge your flashlight, you can charge your phone just by the sun. Or maybe the power goes out 
and your flashlight doesn't work, this thing can be pretty handy in a pinch because it's good to be prepared. But it's also easy to let some things go. Either because we think we're like an, invis an invincible teenager who thinks, oh, it'll never happen to me. Or you've been prepared for things in the past and it never happened, so you stopped being prepared. Well, if it's like that with things of the world, with earthly things, what about being prepared for Jesus' return in glory and power? For centuries, people have foolishly made predictions about when Jesus' return will take place. There was just one a couple of weeks ago, or a month or so ago, that again proved to be false. And all those predictions have been wrong. But every generation, including our own, thinks that it's going to happen in their lifetime. But here we are. We're still here, still waiting, still praying eagerly for his return. So how do you prepare? How do you get ready? How do you have oil enough and more? Or to put it another way, how do you keep your battery charged? Well, there are two ways, the wise way and the foolish way. And the world and your flesh goes the way of the fool. You can be prepared on your own, you think. Because you're good enough. Or you work hard enough. But what do you hear every now and again from people who are even life-going, church-going Christians? I hope I've been good enough to get into heaven. That's the thinking of the world. That's the thinking of your corrupted flesh. That's the foolish way. If you can do it on your own? Really? You can't even keep gas in your lawnmower or your snowblower so you're ready when you need it. If you can't do things like that and be prepared for worldly matters on your own, you can be ready for the return of Jesus as your judge on your own? Well, on your own, by your own efforts, by your own work, it can never be done. When the cry comes, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him, you'll be off doing something else, not ready, not prepared. Because after a while, maybe like a sermon that's going a little too long, you grow sleepy and complacent. You wonder, what's the point? Why do I go to such troubles on Sunday mornings? Jesus hasn't come back yet. Maybe it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Well, it might, it might not. But like students in a classroom, when the teacher steps out for a moment, what can they get away with while the teacher's not looking? How long is it going to be before the teacher comes back in the room? That's the foolish way. That's the thinking of the world and of the flesh. What can you get away with? And funerals are a time when you hear some of that. And you get to hear people talking about death and dying because it's staring them in the face. And you can't ignore it. Mostly we hear platitudes or people reminiscing of old memories of the deceased. And you hear things like, oh, he was such a good guy. She always thought of others before themselves. You never heard them complain. But even the one who rarely ever set foot in the church has said, oh, they were such a devout Christian. 
Really? Going to church twice a year is considered devout? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad to see people come even twice a year, but that's hardly devout. But then there's the other side of that coin. And the every Sunday churchgoer who goes home and beats their wife and abuses their children and spends every last dime they have at the bar. That's hardly the fruits of faith. So how do you be prepared? How do you keep your lamps trimmed with oil enough and more? Well, first, we have to remember that none of us are the ones that does it. It's Jesus who does all that is necessary for you. It is Jesus who sends you the Holy Spirit to call you by the gospel, to work faith in you. For Jesus is the one who dies and who now lives and reigns to all eternity. Jesus is the one who doesn't grow sleepy or complacent or weary but is ever vigilant and hears your cries for mercy. Remember the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane and what Jesus said to them? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. None of us knows when the cry will come that the bridegroom is at hand. But you are made ready through faith. For Jesus comes to you even now by his word preached to you, by his body and blood under bread and wine for you to eat and to drink. And by this holy meal, you are strengthened and you are nourished to life everlasting. And all those times where you've grown sleepy or complacent or lazy, or when you succumb to the desires of your flesh. Maybe even when you've fallen asleep during the sermon or been distracted from the word of God or forgotten your baptism. Jesus comes to you now to rouse you from your slumber. He comes to you to forgive. So when the cry comes, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. You already know the final judgment. You know the final verdict. It's so wonderful and amazing that God lets it leap out ahead of time. And you already heard it this morning. The final judgment is, I forgive you all your sin. Next month marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 moon landing and the last time we saw those pictures of Earth. But as NASA grows closer to once more sending men back to the moon, to Mars, and to where no one has gone before, it's kind of exciting to see what's coming. Some of you remember when Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon and made that one small step for man and how exciting, how exciting it was to see that. But do you know one of the reasons why the Apollo missions stopped? People became bored with it and NASA lost popular support so that they couldn't justify the enormous cost of sending men to the moon. But as exciting as it was to see Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon, the simple everyday tasks of life on Earth carried on. And as NASA reaches out again to touch the moon and to Mars and beyond, 
the normal everyday things of life continue still. And the work of our triune God continues. He continues to make himself known through the simple means of preaching of water, bread, and wine. might not be as exciting as man walking on the moon or going to Mars. But it is heaven on earth. And it's right in front of you. And Jesus is with you every day in your baptism. So when you hear that cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. You're ready. You're prepared with oil enough and more. With the word of God that is the light to your path. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.